All right. Welcome, Internet, to this episode of Pitch Slapped. I am Dan. This is Stefan. Um, and this is our show where we talk about story ideas, movie ideas, any creative ideas that we're working on. So today, Stefan is going to be sharing one of his ideas. So I'm going to hand the mic to Stefan and he's going to pitch something to us. All right. Thank you, Dan, the man. Uh, so today, guys, um, in college, right, I think I had Professor Morgan Peters uh, was a playwright in class and um, we had to write a monologue. And the monologue I chose was about, like, a lion hunter in, like, the... God. Well, it's written down in here. But basically, it took place a long time ago. Um, where, like, the British... Uh, like, I'm really butchering this timetable. Basically, like, uh, World War Two, World War One, World War Two, somewhere in that time frame, England, uh, where they still colonized Africa. Um, it's called Kursari. Um, I've since adapted it into a, I believe a 10 page, maybe more, uh, short story. Um, I no longer know what Kursari means, so it could mean nothing. It could mean something. I, I hope it's cool. It sounded cool when, uh, at the time. Uh, so here we go. It opens with a proverb, uh, that is, uh, unknown who the original speaker of the quote is, but... Until lions have their histories, tales of the hunt shall always glorify the hunter. Hunters, sorry, plural. Um, okay, <clears throat> so shadows across the savanna were disappearing left and right as the sun shifted into its final act. Bryant had been quiet most of our trek. There was no gazing at the beauty this land had to offer or the creatures that inhabited it. For him, it was just another war zone waiting to happen. Prior to shipping out here, Father told me back in the war, Brian had saved his life countless times while their platoon was stationed in France. I don't know how many times I've heard these recountings, but they never dulled over the years. That being said, Brian wasn't able to do the same for his mother and brother. As the story goes, he lost them during the Lowstoft raid. I can't begin to imagine what that does to a man, losing everything you held dear. It's horrifying to even fathom. Father voiced that he tried to take him in, offer him a home and a piece of the family business to repay him for saving his skin. But Bryant refused, claiming there is no one to keep the tea warm at home anymore. Instead, he joined up with the British South Africa Company, where he worked as a pioneer for Cecil Rhodes. I'm not entirely sure what that entails, but it was summarized upon my asking that it meant getting the job done. Even with this move, Father remained close, constantly corresponding with him and going every year or so for a hunt. This year was my turn, as Father said. It's time, Bruce, for you to test your mettle to be a man. Mind you, I believed I was already a man. Up to this point, I had acquired a degree in banking and was set to start a promising career with Nigel Begsby, as well as marry my dearest Jane in May. Yet, for whatever reason, this seemed to have to come first, as if my prior accomplishments meant nothing to my father. Certainly a tough pill to swallow. As I dove into my feelings, Bryant aggressively nudged me with his elbow. Quit your daydreaming, boy. I need you fresh and alert out here. If you let your eyes rest for a moment, you might as well sing it all goodbye. Right, sir. Sorry, sir. The vehicle bounced to and fro as I responded. It trampled over an assortment of rocks, vegetation, and holes in the ground. That moment, I made sure to keep an eye in every direction. I had never shot a gun before, so not knowing what to do, I kept it pointed at whatever could or would come our way. He didn't say anything, but I saw Bryant shake his head. As we passed through the clearing, something scampered hurriedly. Something scampered hurriedly past us. I went to fire the gun when Brian's hand slapped the stock up to the sky. I squeezed the trigger and a loud bang erupted. In the process of deterring my firearm, he was unable to hit the brake and crashed into something. Instantly hit my head on the dash and bounced back into my seat. I should say I hit my head. My apologies. He quickly threw the car into park while I nearly fell out. That, I'm afraid, was the least of our problem. Whatever we hit was yowling madly. I can't say I ever heard such noises. 
As I readjusted and came to, Bryant was now in front of the car, examining the poor bastard pinned under the wheel. One foot followed the next, and I made my way diagonal from where he stood. Clawing and jolting for its life was a hyena. Its back legs were bent upward into the tire shaft. Blood started to sink into a puddle at the base of its body. The howling was unbearable. Thinking it was the right thing to do, I drew my gun and pointed it at the beast. Bryant glared at me. Just what do you think you're doing, son? I cocked the gun back, putting it out of its misery. There's no way it's going to make it. Excuse me. In a matter of steps, Bryant interfered. He slapped the gun out of my hands onto the ground. Don't waste the fucking bullet. At his side was a machete. He stared me down as he drew it and, and turned his attention to the hyena. As he approached it, a rustling rambled from the brush. Three pups, who no doubt belonged to this besieged mother, emerged yapping for her. She gazed at them in what seemed to be a telegraphing look of imminent danger. But before she could vocalize the horror that would befall them, if they stayed, a switch motion from Brian pummeled his blade into the neck, causing the body to release its grasp of the head. Blood spattered across the face of our transportation and noticeably on Bryant himself. I have not witnessed such savagery firsthand. Begs me to wonder how father did on these hunts. The pups didn't scatter off. They continued to yap and approached their mother's head. One licked it, waiting for her to lick back. What are we going to do with them? Is there a preserve or zoo that could take them? Bryant chuckled and wiped his forehead. Have you really learned nothing so far, Thatcher? It's called the wild. There is no safety. There is no mourning. There is only death. The killers and the killed. These mongrels are as good as dead without her. With that, he made his way to the driver's side of the car. So are we going to help them or not? He smiled. Okay, have it your way. We'll help them. In a flash, he drew his sidearm and sprayed lead into the pups, leaving them as dead as their dear old mom. Are you happy? We saved them. But you owe me for the bullets. We can settle up when we make camp. Now let's go. We're wasting what light we have left. I stood there silent. The words wouldn't come. There were no words to say. Making my way to my seat, I noticed Brian had moved from his position. Something had caught his eye. What do we have here? He bent down next to the mother hyena's carcass. That doesn't belong to you. With his left hand, he lifted this lifeless little creature into the air by the scruff of its neck in hopes of making out its identity. Blood and dirt globbed onto it, hiding its coloring. What is that? Bryant looked at it from different angles, even going as far as smelling it. I don't know, but it certainly isn't a hyena pup. He snapped at me with his right hand. Get your water out. He placed the animal on the hood. I grabbed my container from my pack and rained water from above onto it. Blood and dirt emanated off it, showcasing its natural state. I stopped pouring. Is that what I think it is? Brian started to grin. Looks like our luck is changing. We're close. They couldn't have killed this cub far from its pride. The lion cub lay lifeless. The scruff that would become its mane had barely started to grow. Brian walked to the rear of the car and opened his pack, pulling out his blanket. Inquisitively, I watched his every move. What, uh... What exactly are you doing? He refrained from looking at me as he wrapped up the cub. Do you have any idea what the villagers will pay for this? I hadn't the slightest clue. Big or small, these bastards have value. In closing of his thoughts, he knotted the end of the blankets together and packed it back up in his blanket. I slid into my seat, and in a matter of moments, the engine sputtered on. Brian shifted into gear and ran through the hyena below us. I'm not sure I can stomach another journey to this forsaken kind. We haven't come remotely close to a shot at a lion this whole trip, and frankly, I was hoping we wouldn't. All I care about is getting back to Jane. This business with the cub, however, has ignited a passion I never pictured Bryant capable of. Instead of setting up camp, his energy is now being poured into the lengthening darkness, wrestling it for a few more stalking hours. I tried to imagine Jane but I didn't want to risk the chance of being smacked or yelled at again. So I maintained watch, distancing myself from happier thoughts. We made our descent upon a hill. Brian felt that this was the perfect vantage point. There was a watering hole, a river dumped into, and by the looks of it, there wasn't another one for miles. Anything on four legs that required a beverage would end up here. 
and that was when we planned to strike. He went on saying, We are the stalkers of the shadow, the watchers of the dark. They may think they found an easy target of a thirsty gazelle or a wildebeest, but they have fucking target on them now. Oh, but they have a fucking target on them now. Uh, they won't know what hit them. With that, he hopped out of our rig, our ride and pulled out his rifle. I watched as he in inspected it and loaded rounds into it. I can't say if it was the same one from the war. I dare not ask, but all the same, I assume it has seen darkness in many forms. Further from his pack, he looped a belt of ammunition around his neck, so it draped over him diagonally on the right. He turned toward me. What are you doing? You're not going to make Daddy proud by sitting on your ass. I decided it was probably best not to respond, so I nodded and exited the vehicle. In the back, the blanket holding the cub was next to my pack. It was starting to smell. With haste, I grabbed my own belt of rounds and a pair of binoculars. Uh, farther, my belt of rounds and a pair of binoculars. Farther gave me for, father gave me for the trip. My apologies. Uh, father gave me for the trip. Brian had fixed a scope onto his rifle and was glaring down at the watering hole, lining every and any poor beast who dipped its tongue in. The breeze started to pick up here and there, and a recent gust, gust launched the cub stench into my face. Practically gagging, I stumbled backwards away from our position. The air was slightly more breathable. As I caught my breath, I placed the binoculars to my eyes and attempted to pretend to be interested in this. Yet as I scanned, my charade became dejectively false. I had looked onto a locked onto a male, a king of the jungle. He was roughly 90 yards away from the watering hole beneath a tree. I stammered trying to get the words out of my mouth. I even started shaking my hand toward Brian, hoping he'd pick up on that I found something. Excuse me. My eyes never left the binoculars. This main maned behemoth was walking was a walking sculpture. From nose to tail, he had to be at least eight feet long. I tried again to get Bryant's attention, but as I opened my mouth, the male let out an echoing roar. In moments, Bryant was by my side as this specimen of Panthera Leo made itself comfortable. Using the scope on his rifle, he was able to make out where it was. Would you look at that size of that boy? He lowered his rifle and snatched the binoculars off my face. Let's get a better look at you. The lion laid there swatting its tail every few seconds. His eyes just stared straight on, never admitting he was looking back at you or not. He's defenseless. Now's the time, Thatcher. Time to prove to your da that you're a man. Ready that rifle, boy. Nervously, I picked up the binoculars strap, binocular strap over my head and got on the ground level. Bryant kneeled down, maintaining his gaze on the lion. I pointed my rifle in its direction and watched as I cocked the hammer back. Brian's hands tightened on the binoculars. Wind brushed through my hair and fluttered some of the feathers in Brian's hat. Time seemed to slow down as sweat emerged from my temple. It felt like hours had gone by. The lion never changed position. It had no idea what was going to happen to it. Plenty of moments passed when I could have pulled the trigger, but I just couldn't do it. I failed to see how this makes anyone a man. The lion could just as easily be me. I shifted my rifle and sat upwards. Bryant turned his attention from the lion to me. He slowly dropped the binoculars. Mr. Thatcher, what seems to be the problem here, hmm? I, s I went to respond, but his rant picked up. I know what it is. All of a sudden, you've decided to catch the human disease. A conscience. Allow me to persuade you otherwise, would you? He grabbed me by the collar of my shirt and jostled me to the direction of the lion, pointing directly at it. His tirade continued. You see that beast right there? Of course you do. It's in your sights as we speak. That very monster has been the nemesis of man since the dawn of time. Surely you know of the first labor of Hercules, or of the cave paintings depicting the savagery these animals are capable of. As he went on rambling in the shadows, something was lurking. We weren't alone on this vantage point. I tried to make out what it was, but he shook me to get my attention. Let's make it slightly more personal, shall we? Do you, Thatcher, believe that that, that lion here would have the same reserve about you? Because let me snap that out of your head. When you're out here, it's a battleground. You have to make peace with two things. There is no guarantee you are going to return home, and they already know you're here. 
Take a look for yourself. He adjusted my, my neck, so I was now looking at the mail. Every time I tried to return my gaze to the mystery of what was mucking about, he would squeeze me harder against my head to force me into a direction of his choosing. You think he is simply mumbling about on purpose? Oh, no, no, no. He's biding his time, waiting, wondering, what are we going to do next? What you don't see is that the tide is quickly turning. The hunt is concocting a plan. Soon enough, my boy, we are going to be in a world of trouble. You didn't do much research before coming out here, did you? The male's job is to watch the young and keep other males at bay, while the females hunt. As he said, as he said this, as he said, he shot saliva across my chin. He loosened his grasp of my head, and as I turned to face him, that's when I saw them. Silently, they had been inching closer and closer. One was in the back of the car near near the cub, while four others had split to two on each side. They had been tracking it, hoping to rectify the situation and return their lost baby home to safety, only to stumble upon us. My eyes filled with fear as I mumbled out, f f females He didn't take the hint. He just picked up where he left off. You heard me right. Females. Plural. Look at the sky. It's getting darker, isn't it? The time to act is imminent. No more of this pansy moral compass bullshit. You either become the monster or you remain the scum at the bottom of the b- b- Before he could finish the end of his harangue, a lioness launched herself on top of him. Her fangs jammed into the right side of his neck as her claws anchored him down. In a matter of seconds, the others joined her, ripping into his flesh and exposing his innards across the ground. Paralyzed in fear, I watched as they approached me. Blood oozed off their whiskers. There was no escape. My end was imminent. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. That was a very dramatic clap, but yeah, good job, Steph. Good reading, too. Thank you, sir. Krasari, by the way, uh, I looked it up, uh, means lion. Oh, right on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some variation of it means lion, so, like, right on the nose. Uh, yeah, um, I'm trying to, like, <laughs> break up, like, my thoughts about the story. I, I love um, the character of Brian. Like, it sounds like that, I, I kind of know a little bit because I've read this before, but that was the character that you did a monologue for, right? Like, the character of Brian. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. his his first name and I don't manage to mention it, but his first name is Alistar Bryant. Um, so originally it was just that end monologue where he was yelling at Bruce to stop being a pansy and shoot the lion. I think what I really like about that character is like he you could tell he kind of just likes the sound of his voice, or I don't know, he sounds like a little crazed. Like he reminds me a little bit like Captain Ahab in like Moby Dick a little bit, but he's just like crazy about lions, uh, <laughs> you know? And it's funny too, like how, like he's so like bullheaded about getting a lion and yet he's like not aware <laughs> about the females behind him because he's so busy like yelling at this kid, you know, um, trying to tell him how the world works. You know what I mean? Um, so I, I love that character, uh, and I love that he kind of gets his in the end, um, especially since you see him do, like, pretty horrific stuff, um, and it's portrayed in a pretty horrific way, you know? Um, so I think you do an awesome job fleshing out that character, and I really like Thatcher, too. Um, like, it, it sounds like the way you wrote this, you know, you started with a monologue, from Brian, and then you kind of, like, reverse engineered, like, a larger story, maybe, like, who is he talking to, and, you know, like, where are they headed, um, and I like the backstory you had for Thatcher, too, um, like, I, does he have a first name, or was that his first name? Uh, um, so his first name is Bruce. That's right, okay, Bruce, um, I liked that he's on this expedition to try to, like, prove to his father, um, that he is a man, uh, and he's reluctantly on this journey and he doesn't want to be there. Um, 
and I feel like the your pairing of those two characters is really good. You know what I mean? Like, like what made you want to choose that type of character to pair with, you know, to pair with Brian? Uh, so, um, when I wrote this, right, like you said, it just was a monologue and you got, you hit the nail on the head, right? I just tried to think, okay, I like this story. I like this character. I want to develop something that goes with it, right? Make it a little bit of a longer uh, piece. Um, so I just thought like, if there's one kind of like macho man, right? Like there can't be too macho man. Cause then no one's going to really like, there's no emotion to it. Right. It's just too macho man. So somebody has to be like, kind of like, you know, an every man, right. Where you, you, the reader, right. Can connect with. So like when I was writing it, I was like, yeah, I don't want to kill lions. I don't want to even be on this kind of, I want to be with, you know, with Jane. Uh, right. So I tried to put like how I would feel if I was forced to go on this, um, you know, lion hunt to prove I'm a man. Right. Like, uh, and I think some of that cut stems from like, you know, uh, toxic masculinity, right. We're like, Oh, you gotta be like, like Brian is, is the Alistar Brian is that. But, um, when I was younger, uh, there's a movie called the ghost in the darkness, right. Which is uh, about these real life lions that were called the ghost in the darkness that were killing, people in this this specific area of africa and they had a, a a hunter they brought in and then they had a more seasoned hunter right so it was val kilmer and then the more seasoned hunter was uh, michael douglas so that movie stuck with me as i wrote this and it's like okay let's maybe flesh out one character give him a little bit more emotional uh like not trying to be so cool and hard like maybe he's a bit of a like uh you know, he's a banker. Bankers don't shoot people, you know? Um, yeah. So that's that's kind of how um, I tried to go about Brian and Alistar. Um, the scene with the hyena, right? Uh, that actually, I was talking with my sister Bella about uh, the story, and she was like, yeah, have him uh, be ruthless and savage when he kills this hyena. So she uh, was kind of my springboard for that whole scene where he's just like, this don't waste the bullet cuts the thing's head off like that. Bella is uh, directly responsible for that. Uh, Pretty dark. How old was she when <laughs> when she recommended that? Um, uh, I mean, good advice, Bella. But so she, well, she's fourteen. So she'd be she was thirteen when she recommended oh, that to me. Okay, I gotcha. But that's around the age. Yeah, that's around. <laughs> if she was like five years old, I would be like, oh my god, I know she's not five. Um, but um, yeah, that's awesome stuff. I and I think like your instinct to pair like those two very different characters was really good. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, I just really good stuff there. Um, I also think like, you know, this is really not story related, but it's the way you tell the story. Like, honestly, stuff I've known you for a few years, but like there are moments in here I'm like, like, that was really cool, just the way you told the story. Like, you're building suspense, like, little moments of suspense into the story. Like, they run over this thing. What is this thing that they run over? Oh, it's a hyena. You know what I mean? Like, you tell the reader afterwards, like, you know, after the person discovers it. Um, and one moment that I really liked that you did that was when it was um, the the dead um, lion cub. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, they're like, what is this thing? You know what I mean? Um and then when, you know, they can still see it, you're still withholding that information. It's not like, oh, my God, that's a lion cob. You know what I mean? You say, is that what I think it is? You know what I mean? Like, you still withhold that information from the reader. So it's like, you keep me interested. You know what I mean? Like, throughout the story, I'm just like, I'm always like, you know, you do little little turns like that. And I think uh, that's awesome. You know, I, I, I'm envious of that. <laughs> um Oh well, you know, I and I I appreciate that greatly, Dan. That's um uh, something I think in the I still struggle with, right? So I'm glad that it worked out this time for this story. Yeah, um, no, I thought it was awesome. I thought you did a really good job with that building the suspense. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, really. Again, thank you. Um, I I do know that's something I do need to continue to work on, but uh, uh really, thank you. I'm glad I'm glad that ended up uh you know transcending how. Uh, at least in my head, I was like, oh, this would be cool, right? Like, um, 
You know, the other thing with this is like, you know, kind of like with your thing, I like to think like we're writing things we, we'd like to see read, we'd like to watch, right? We'd like to see come to life one way or another. Um, so uh, I tried to think of it if it was a movie, right? Uh, to the best way to write it as if it was one without making it a movie, that kind of thing. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And I think something else I really liked about your piece is like how visual it is. Like I could literally see, you know, uh, Brian like putting on that, like that thing on his right side with all of the bullets, you know what I mean? Like you have, you have moments that are, you know, very clear in my mind, just listening to it, even like, so something I, I notice that I am not very good at um, that you lean into is like writing about violence. Uh, and the way you write about violence is very visual too. You know what I mean? Like it's never, it's always like, I always like when I was listening to that, I was like cringing, but in like a good way. <laughs> so it was like, you know, I hate gore. Um, and you know, I think the way you, you write it is very visual. So like, kudos to you you know maybe that that's a springboard from watching watching a lot of movies and you, you're trying to write it like a movie but you know I think you do a really good job at that um I had a question about like the historical elements of um this piece because you start off like giving us a setting you know I forget what the particular um historical war like centerpiece was but um how did you come up with that and like how did you what made you decide to like integrate that in and I, I guess a broader question is like research like how do you like I'm assuming you didn't know a lot about lions before you started this or maybe you did and I'm just like you know <laughs> I just don't know about lions in general, but like, um, it sounds like you, you took s some care to like do a little bit, bit of research, but not like too much that you were overwhelmed. So like, how do you do that? <laughs> uh, so, um, again, like re reverse, you said reverse engineering. Uh, so I, I, I said it in this time period, right? Like, I think it's slightly after world war one or just after, you know, some, I think it's just after world war one. Um, and I could be wrong on that. Um, so I, I first I typed in, you know, okay, when was England bombed during World War One? Or I really want to say it's World War One, but anyway. And then they listed it, right? And it was like, oh, Lowestoft raid. I was like, okay, cool, that checks out. And then I was like, when was lion hunting like around? Was like in this time period? And I was like, okay, so then like I tried to match it up as close as I could. Um, Obviously, you know, there's some liberties being taken here. And then the British South Africa Company really is something. And I'm pretty sure it was run by Cecil Rhodes. Like, so uh, uh, those those two things are facts. Yeah. Um, as far as lions, uh, you know, at first my general knowledge of lions is like the Lion King and the Ghost <laughs> in the Darkness, right? Like mm -hmm. that whole thing. Uh, but Sam for a period of time, right? Like he's teaching biology and I don't think it's really connected, but, uh, or maybe it is connected, but anyway, he was what looking up stuff on his own time about, um, you know, animals. And one of them was lions. And he started telling me about how lions, uh, Roman packs, right. Or, uh, they'll fight other males for dominance of their, you know, realm and take territory. Like they're essentially maimed street gangs, right? It's like you and me are boys, we're going to go fuck up some other lions and take over the savannah, right? And then they would just, like, hook up with all the female lions to spread their, you know, uh, get their seed. Their, seed, yeah. their seed going, right? So, like, lions are crazy and, and violent, violent creatures. So I learned a lot of stuff uh, from just hearing what Sam would then summarize and tell me. And then I started looking into it because it's like, yeah, that's really cool. Or like, I don't like hyenas, right? Once I got learning about them. So I was cool with hyenas getting killed. And they are lions' uh, natural, like, competitor. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, they go back and forth between eating each other's children. And it's, like, vicious. Um, like, a bunch of hyenas will gang up on lions, but then lions will, like, roll up on them and murder them. And it, th it's kind of satisfying, uh, you know, to watch lions get revenge on hyenas. 
but so a lot of that information was uh, attributed from uh, Sam summarizing stuff he uh, saw, and then I looked up some videos, and I was like, yeah, that's really cool. I think that's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. You're really pulling from a lot of different, you know, places. Um, yeah, I don't, I, what else is there to say? I took a few notes, but, um, I have a question. Uh, I mean, it seems like the logical, like, conclusion to the story is, like, they both die. But, like, I feel so bad for uh, for Bruce Thatcher. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, mm. like he didn't want to be there. Uh, and, you know, he's sort of like a casualty of, you know, this this thing he didn't even want to be a part of. Um, <laughs> what are your thoughts about um, killing off Bruce Thatcher? Was that an easy thing for you to do? Uh, was that something you knew from the get-go, like he was going to die? I mean, it seems natural, because, like, how is he going to get away in that situation? But, um, yeah. No, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I think in the, originally, when I wrote it, it as just a monologue, right, it, it ended with saying, like, as... Thatcher is monologuing, um, not Thatcher, as uh, Alistair Bryant is monologuing, you know, the females who act, you know, the female lines do do the hunting, right? They get a lot, they don't get as much credit as they should, uh, female lions, but um, it, it ends, the monologue ends with the female lions sneaking up and ultimately it eating them. So from the jump, I, I knew they were both going to die. Um, and then as I expanded it, right, like the proverb says, you know, until lions have their own historians, tales of the hunt shall always glorify the hunters. So, like, I wanted this to be a story where, like, you know, the lions get theirs in the end, right? It's, yeah. You know, Thatcher just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time, you know, um, as most unfortunate, like, characters in horror you know, animal based movies go, right? Yeah. So it's I like, was gonna say, um sorry, you you continue. No 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 go ahead, buddy. No, I was gonna say, um it, it kind of like gives a little bit of credence to like what Alistair Bryan was saying though. You know what I mean? Like um like yeah Alistair Bryan is like an extreme form of like awful toxic masculinity and he's all about like survival of the fittest and stuff but like i feel like at the end you know like bruce kind of learns that lesson like unfortunately the hard way you know what i mean like um and i also found it interesting like that bruce was always like aligning him well not always but there are moments where he aligns himself with the animals um and uh, Alistair Brian is like quick to be like, don't do that. You know what I mean? Like we are different and almost like trying to create like a hierarchy of like beings in his mind and being like, you know, the only way that we stay on top is if we, you know, kill other apex predators, you know what I mean? Um, so it was just, it, I just found it really interesting. I couldn't like help, but notice, you know, that, I think there is a kernel of truth in what, uh, you know, Alistair was saying as crazy and as awful as he is, you know, like, you know, these, these creatures don't care about us, you know? So I thought that was, that was cool. I feel, I mean, you said it beautifully, my friend, really, thank you. Um, but I, again, that's true, right? Like they tell you it's a dog eat dog world, right? If one thing won't get you, another thing will, um, so that's kind of like, you know, Alistair seeing how horrible war is, right? Like, so how people treat each other, you know, that's, that lion's not even a, like, it's not a person and it, it'll eat you like nothing, you know, no one's business. So, yeah. you know, it's a man who's uh, harboring demons and dealing with, I'm sure being shell shocked, just like, listen, man, everything's a battlefield. His eyes are open, right? Cause it's like, there's no such thing as tranquility. There's just hunted and hunter alive and dead yeah that's it i think it's so interesting because like uh he is so quick to dehumanize 
other creatures, but also like people in general. Like he doesn't really cr- like treat Bruce as like an equal. You know what I mean? Like he he kind of treats him as like a lesser inferior person. Um, so he like tries to dehumanize other people. You know, and he has that backstory as well, which sort of sort of justifies it in his eyes. You know what I mean? Like he's seen horrible people. He's seen horrible things done by people. Probably he's done horrible things. Um, so it's just the way he has lived. And I feel like you see on the other spectrum, Bruce trying to humanize these creatures, you know, um, he's really not had that sort of like traumatic backstory. Um, so it's just, it's just interesting that like these two, I don't know, there's like something in between that I think is like kind of true about lions. You know what I mean? Like they don't care about us, but like they also, you know, I don't know. They, they still coexist with us somehow, you know? So, yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? We've always on some playing field, right? We were competitors for the same sort of food sources, right? Water, shelter, food, you know, back down to the primal, primal instincts. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, you know, as Highlander says, there can only be one. Right, so is it going to be me, or is it going to be you, or is it going to be the lion? One way or another, one of you, two men enter, one man leave. You know, and I yeah. guess Alistar is just like, look, man, you need to understand that, right? Like maybe your dad didn't understand that in the war, and I had to save him, so he sent you to me, right? Um, you know, he sent you to me to to become a man, right? It's maybe something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. I I really like this story. I told you that when I read it the first time, but um, hearing you read it out loud, I was just like, this was good. This was good. <laughs> um, so thank you. Thank you for sharing stuff. Uh, it was a good time, you know. Uh, I guess some other questions, uh, <laughs> stretching our time here. Um, if you could cast these roles, who do you see um being cast so i think toby mcguire like young toby mcguire like um cider house rules toby mcguire should be um bruce thatcher and alistair bryant should be like terminator salvation christian bale where he yells a lot and he's crazy yeah interesting uh it's funny you said toby mcguire because i i kind of thought bruce Reminded me of Nick Carraway a little bit. Mm. Um, I don't know if you did that intentionally, but he just the way he came off, I was like, it, it sounds a little bit like Nick Carraway. So like, I kind of had <laughs> him in my mind too. So maybe this is destiny at this point. You know, I would love to see them just Christian Bale going bananas, yelling at Toby Maguire while killing a hyena. That would be awesome. Yeah, you know, I could see it. I or like American it. Psycho. Christian Bale. I want Ridley Scott to make it. That's who I want to direct this movie. You don't want to direct it? You're going to hand over uh, the creative direction of this? Uh, I think if if Ridley Scott would do it, then if he was open to it, right, I would be like, yes, please, please make this movie. Um, but if they were like, hey man, we'll let you direct it, but we're not get- giving you a Christian Bale, then my second would be, I would like Nicolas Cage to play uh, Alistair Bryant. I could see it. Two two distinct actors who break very different levels. Mm. Um, I say you co-direct it with Ridley Scott. <laughs> Ridley Scott. <laughs> Not that he's really ever done that before, um, but you know maybe he'll produce it and just let you direct it. I don't know. Ooh, another guy that would be good would be um, Andy Serkis. I think he'd be yeah. great as uh, Bryant. Yeah. Andy Serkis or Christian Bale? I love Nicolas Cage, but if I want this movie to be serious, Andy Serkis or Christian Bale? Can Andy Serkis also play the lion? <laughs> Absolutely. He can also lion. direct it. I'd be okay if he directed it, starred yeah. as Bryant, and was the lion. Hey, you know, I, I think that might actually happen. <laughs> we can hope. Yeah. We can hope. Well, that's awesome. Awesome casting, and... Um, you know, I know it's just a fantasy, but it sounds like that would be cool. That would be killer. Well, you never know, man. Like, I, I'm, one day they might be on YouTube and they might stumble upon our channel. And then, you know, next thing you know, Jordan Peele's like, yo, man, 
I want to make a summer horror anthology with what you laid out. <laughs> you do you, Jordan. Peele. <laughs> you, you, do you. <laughs> you had me at your, your message. <laughs> yes. Uh, but no, no man, this, this is always a good time. Thank you for listening and, and for your very, very kind words, my man. So I appreciate you listening and your kind words and uh, those who tuned in, I appreciate you listening and sticking around. Um, and I guess that'll do it for, for our show this evening. But uh, make sure to stay tuned. And we got more adventures here on Pitch Slap coming your way. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, everyone. 